I'm Christian, and welcome to the Jamoir Leadership Podcast, a show where we talk about effective collaboration, influence, and leadership in an increasingly complex world. My interview partner is Dr. Dirk Schlimm. Dirk is an international leadership expert and the author of Influencing Powerful People. The purpose of this podcast is to share ideas and stimulate discussion, and it does not constitute professional advice of any kind. If such advice is needed, the services of a competent professional should be sought. The speakers, host, and Gemar International Incorporated are not to be held responsible for any use, misuse, or reuse of the content. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gemar Leadership Podcast. Wow, we're already in February. Time is really flying. So let's keep it going here. We love that you're back and we love that we have another conversation to have with you. Today, we want to have a bit of a follow-up discussion uh, on our topic of conflict management. Uh, Hopefully, you remember our last episode on the drama on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. So a conflict between people who are on the same team was the topic. So if you haven't seen that or haven't listened, go check it out. Highly recommend it. But In that conversation, we talked about the very often predicament where people find themselves in conflict in business with people who they are working with, working alongside. So today we want to look at another example of conflict management and conflict discussion, albeit in a very different context, in a very different part of the world. And I believe that this is an example that will also teach us some important lessons. So you'll want to pay close attention, I think. Today's episode we're going to travel all the way to the small German town of Lutzerat, where Dirk is going to tell us some information about what's going on in Germany. So Dirk, as we start, why don't you give us some context? Where is Lutzerat and why has it become so famous or again, should I say infamous? Yeah, uh, thanks, Christian. So the the tiny village or hamlet, as it would be called, of uh, Lützerat is, or better was, uh, located west of the city of Düsseldorf uh, towards the uh, German-Dutch border. So truly on the western side of of, uh, uh, West Germany, if you you will. And it is in the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia, which is uh, Germany's most densely populated state and also the the most industrialized uh, state. And when I say was, uh, I mean, so the, the village itself, uh, the hamlet itself was first mentioned as, as early as the 12th uh, century, wow. uh, but it now has been uh, deserted or evicted, uh, depending on your point of view, um, to make room for the expansion of a huge open surface coal mine, uh, more specifically a mine for lignite or uh, brown coal, as it's uh, as it's called, which is used to, uh, to generate electricity. Now, as you can imagine, this did not sit well at all with climate activists in Germany. And so they they converged on uh, the village to stop the mining project. And, and that's why, why, why it, it, it made the, the, the news headline the way it is. And, and this led to a, a police operation in January of this year, where eventually all the activists were removed, some of them forcibly. And among them was uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, who was seen uh, carried away by police officers uh, in front of the rolling uh, the rolling cameras. Wow, Dirk, that is very dramatic indeed. I've seen some of the footage, definitely a big event. And I could already say I'm not so much of a political person, but as a history person, you got me hooked hearing about this town from the, the 12th century and how its history is unfolding today. But I think most people here are, are interested in the conflict management. So let, let's drill in a bit here. In this podcast mini-series that we're talking about conflict and people on the same team, I would think that the climate activists are on one side and the mining company and the police were on the other side. So in this episode, it feels like we're talking about conflict between two very different teams. Am I getting that right? Well, yeah, that's exactly uh, what one would think. And, and there mm-hmm. obviously is a is a, a conflict there. But again, we're, we're talking here about conflict among people who are on the same team, uh, so to speak. And, and so the interesting aspect here, or at least the interesting aspect for, for our purposes here, um, is that the, the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, again, where, where Lützerath is located uh, in, in, in Germany, and so, so the state government and the German federal government both have coalition governments right now, uh, in which the Green Party uh, plays a prominent 
role. And so uh, prominent members of the Green Party both came out in, in favor of raising the village of uh, Lützerath, so to speak, to allow the mining operation, and and so so it was was really um, um, both again state and federal uh, green politicians who were in favor with that, and that of course infuriated the climate activists, and they 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 really they really were very unhappy uh, with with the Green Party in this case. Okay, Dirk, that's some new information uh, for me, and that's definitely fascinating, and I could see where people are detecting a bit of a problem. So let's unpack that a bit more. Why did the Green Party, out of all parties, support the mine to go ahead? Wouldn't they want to, I think about Green Party politics, wouldn't they be interested in phasing out coal mining as quickly as possible? And wouldn't they be fighting to save a village like this one? Especially since brown coal, as I understand it, is quite dirty and also quite inefficient, even as compared to what I know about other types of coal. Yeah, and and that's that's exactly exactly it. And, and of course, uh, they uh, they would have wanted that. But but with the war in Ukraine and the sanctions on Russian energy, uh. Uh, Germany has found itself in actually quite a severe bind, and they they needed to find alternatives to to Russian oil and gas uh, quickly. And and so as as part of this. Uh, uh, plan to 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 really get get away from Russian oil and gas the green party supported a limited mining operation which included Litzerat but but also the plan saved a number of other villages that would have been part of a a broader uh, mining mining operations and and they also explained that that why they were uh um the, in in government, they they are also part of a coalition government, so they're not the, the the government as such, so to speak. And so they had to make arrangements with their coalition uh, partners who who wanted the mine to continue. And they also pointed out that there were some court decisions that that approved the mining operation. So so what they felt was they felt they had done the best uh, they could again by saving some villages, but not the village of Litzerat. Wow, Dirk, that is quite the drama unfolding here so many elements going into it all levels of politics even a war in the background here but analyzing this one event Dirk I know we can't read minds here but to me this sounds like from the Green Party a, a heavy dose of pragmatism what do you think about that yeah I I exactly and and so this is what what the uh the, where the debate then happened between climate activists uh who who are a very powerful group in in Germany and the green party establishment if there is such a thing maybe the green party mm. doesn't doesn't like the term uh, uh establishment they they usually think about uh, other parties and and so so there the, there was that debate and and I read the transcript of one of the debates uh, quite a passionate debate between uh Luisa Neubauer who is the the face of German climate activism and Katarina Drogi, who is a senior Green Party uh, politician, she actually went to uh, University of Cologne, which is just south of Düsseldorf, and and she would know the Lützerath mining district uh, quite well. Got you, Dirk. Thanks for introducing some of the characters here. So what can we here on the Gemoir Leadership Podcast learn from the conflict between the two of them? Yeah. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, Ms. Neubauer, as an activist, is not... Uh, shy and is uh, very much used to going hard to her opponents, and she certainly does not spare Miss uh, Drogi just because she's a member of the Green Party. Uh, mm -hmm. If if anything, she 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 goes at her even a bit bit harder, uh, and it's like saying, "Hey, I expected better from you." And uh, Miss Drogi, she is a battle hardened uh, politician, a senior member of her her party, and uh, she is not shy either. So we really have to. Two assertive uh, people here who are, uh, if you will, duking, duking it out. Right, Dirk. So putting it in lay terms, it sounds like Miss Neubauer thinks that Miss Drogi is a sellout. Well, yeah, I would say something like that. And right. and so um, what she's saying is that the, the Green Party is now trying to make caving in look like a win and is is not owning up to their defeat on this. And and of course, Ms. Drogi is, is countering that things look very differently when you actually have the responsibility and, and that uh, they had the choice between more, uh, but not perfect climate protection or nothing. Uh, and again, they are in government, but they're just part of a coalition government. And so they have to negotiate with coalition uh, partners. And again, in addition, the energy crisis uh, brought on by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And as she points out, previous 
uh, German significant reliance on Russian energy. Uh, many people now say over-reliance. This made the adjustment necessary. And of course, she's a good politician. She's reminding everyone that this over-reliance on uh, Russian oil and gas, the, the bind that uh, Germany finds itself in now, was brought about by the previous government, not the, the Green Party government. Right, Dirk. And when we say terms of over-reliance and then this uh, party looking back on the previous government, it sounds like they're trying to be part of fixing the mistakes of the past, so to speak, anyway. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how they're framing it. Right. And framing things properly is probably something that they take very seriously and something we should take uh, pretty seriously, I think, as well. How we frame a matter definitely shapes how we approach it. But Getting to that exchange between the two people here, what can we actually and practically learn from that? Yeah, I, I think the first thing we can learn is that even with the best intention, we cannot avoid uh, conflict. Ms. Drogi wanted to do the best she could with what she had, uh, but Ms. Neubauer wanted none of it. She wanted to save Litzerat, no matter what the economic consequences might be. And, and this type of conflict um, is normal in uh, business as well. We cannot hope to avoid it by thinking we have done a good job or we have take a reasonable or justifiable course of action. At least we cannot always uh, avoid it. So, so why you don't go looking for a fight, conflict will find you. And so if you want to be a, a manager, you need to be ready for conflict because you will have to make some unpopular and some uncomfortable decisions. Everything from shutting down a project or terminating people's employment or giving a promotion to one person when another person was hoping to get it. And, and that will invite pushback. So as a manager, we need a stomach for conflict. We need to engage and we must not run away from it. And I just heard this from an experienced leader who described it as running into the fire to extinguish the fire rather than running uh, away from it. Because if you run away from the fire, it will spread further. Got it, Dirk. So I'm writing down my notes here. And a key point that I'm taking away is that stomach for conflict is a prerequisite for being a manager. It sounds like there will be times as a manager when we have to assert ourselves, even if we don't like conflict. It just comes with the territory. So Dirk, what's next? Um, yeah, so... so I would say what next is that at a, at a high level here, the positions of our climate activist and green politician are pretty clear. The, the one wants no compromises on climate change, and the other one thinks compromises are necessary, even if we don't like them. But then as they carry on with their with their discussion, passionate discussion, they engage in a in a very detailed and expert exchange on climate change targets, CO2 budgets, energy sources, energy policy. And, and so on. And you, you realize that things are really a lot more complicated than the high level story uh, of whether or not to make a compromise to keep a surface mine open. And, and you also see that both of them are very well versed at having these discussions, again, with a lot of facts and details, which, of course, they're positioning to support their respective arguments. Right, Dirk. So as I'm taking my notes here, it feels like things are never as easy as they seem is kind of a big deal. Yeah, and, and that's right. And so I think the second learning really uh, for us to take away here is that if we get into conflict over a business issue, we must be well prepared. In, mm. in business, now to translate it, we must know our numbers. What are the costs? What are the returns? What are the failure rates? What are the quality levels? And, and, and so on. And I've seen this very often where, where people have a high level story or they have uh, anecdotes, but they're not able to back up their arguments with sufficient facts and details. And you have to prepare, you have to know the detail. And, and ideally, you have thought very carefully about the objections uh, of your conflict counterparts. And like in our story here, you, you may not always uh, get what you want, but you always want to get the best with what you have. And so putting forward a credible, coherent, and fact-based argument is really a big part of this. Right, Dirk. That makes a lot of sense. Preparation is the name of the conflict game, we could say. And I think that we could see this in so many places, just thinking about it. Uh, winging it or bluffing your way through conflict is rarely a good strategy. It rarely plays out well. So, just summarizing right now, we have to have the stomach for conflict as managers. And as we do that, we have to come prepared. 
Is there a third lesson we can learn from our story here about the fight in Lutzerat? Yes, it is. And, and that re relates specifically to how one is assertive in, in, in conflict, not just in terms of shying away from conflict or preparing well for conflict, but also show your assertiveness in a manner that is effective. Right, Derek, assertive. I think we like the sound of that. But isn't it better just thinking about it, thinking about terms to be constructive rather than assertive in these situations? Yeah, Christian, you're right. Being constructive is important. And by the way, what that means is that I behave in a way that allows me to advance any uh, interests uh, um, that, that that I have. But at the same time, I, I do not just damage the relationship with my uh, counterpart. And in fact, we should work in a manner that's unconditionally uh, constructive. And that means to be constructive, even if our counterpart is is not uh it's hard to do but it's worthwhile and and something that we will probably all have to keep working at uh throughout our professional lives right Dirk. so i think you're calling on us our listeners now to think about in these situations both what it is what you want and the relationship itself that makes sense so Dirk, now think about it where does a certain assertiveness come in as a good thing here yeah, well, well, just because you're constructive doesn't mean you won't have strong convictions, or it certainly doesn't mean that you're a, a pushover. On, mm. on the contrary, it, it, it means that you have your emotions under control and you express them appropriately. And we talked about this at length in our last episode uh, about the conflict on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. And, and so sometimes you have to be more forceful and you have to let your counterpart know that just because you're not rude or you don't shout or you don't call them names, um, you you can stand up for your convictions and you you stand up for what you think is the right thing to do. Right, Dirk, that makes sense again. But do we see this actually play out in the story of Miss Neubauer, the activist, and Miss Drogi, the politician? Yeah, actually, we do, and and it's a bit of a classic. Okay, unpack that. Yeah. So, well, at, at one point, Ms. Neubauer interrupts Ms. Drogi and and uh, uh, she jumps right in and says, hey, uh, could you please let me finish? And she says, I have listened to you and I would like to conclude my train of thought. And and this uh, actually happens twice. And and at, at some point in the, in the second interruption, Ms. Drogi says, hey, can I finish my sentence? Because I was answering your question, uh, but I don't have to finish my, uh, uh, my sentence if you're not interested. And, and so she's calling out there uh, a little bit. Well, bold, but that's assertive. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. It is. And, and so letting people finish, especially if they have first listened to you, is a universal principle of co good conduct and fair play, play. And so when you're being interrupted in a situation like this, you have what we might call the moral high ground, especially here again, where Ms. Drogi was answering a question that Ms. Neubauer, <laughs> Neubauer had been asking her. And and of course, it wasn't a real question, uh, uh, so, so, so to speak. It wasn't really that Ms. Neubauer was, was looking for an answer. She was looking to make a point with her question, but nonetheless, she had asked uh, uh, the question. And, and so this is where Ms. Drogi comes across as perfectly reasonable when, when she insists that she finish and make that point uh, strongly. And, and that really sends an important signal. Yes, I'm reasonable. Yes, I'm constructive but I will not allow myself to be walked all over. Right, Dirk, that makes sense. And that's a very clear example for what we're talking about here. And thinking about that story, it looks like Miss Drogi really got the better of Miss Neubauer in that exchange. Yes, she did. But then towards the very end of the conversation, it is Miss Drogi who interrupts Miss Neubauer, right? And of course, she returns the favor uh, immediately. She's not letting this one, uh, this one go. Right, of course. And bringing it back to our conversation and my notes, it sounds like the third lesson here is that while you always want to be constructive in a business conflict, you also want to be assertive. Yeah, and, and Christian, maybe again, if you look at this in, in, in kind of a conflict that happens inside a company and often there's like, you know, different members of different uh, departments who get, get into this, um, look at it this way. The company you work for has, to, has asked you to do a job and so your job is obviously important and adds value because otherwise you wouldn't have it. And, and so you don't have to think that your department is in any way less important than other departments. And you owe it to uh, the company to contribute your insights, your perspectives, and your business arguments in the best possible way. And if needed, in a forceful way. 
And you do that, of course, then in a constructive manner. And that's what good conflict behavior is really is really all about. All right. Thanks, Dirk. That's really helpful insight. And I'm looking at the time as we're coming to the end here. And before we get to that summary we like to give, why don't you just give us your executive judgment here? Who won the debate over Lutzerat? Yeah, that that <laughs> Christian, that is a is a, a, a great question. And the first thing I would say is that this whole affair really has upended some previous conventional wisdom about politics in in Germany. And as the Economist points out, and we'll we'll have that 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 article here for uh, for reference. And as I point out, as I think quite rightly, uh, you would think that this whole thing could have been. Uh, a bit of a public relations disaster for the German Green Party uh, to be the party in government that drags Greta Thunberg of all people from a from a mining site and you know you should see those monster mining machines they they're quite something because this is open surface uh, uh, surface mining but but it wasn't a public relations disaster uh, for them in fact the Green Party has fared quite well and is seen today as a competent party in government when dealing with energy uh, issues and, and the climate crisis and the war in Ukraine, which is, of course, a huge and quite immediate concern in, in Germany because people are so close to it. And the um, senior politicians of the Green Party are among the most popular ones of all the coalition uh, parties. So it really looks like the pragmatism uh, is working for them and they're able to get their message across and they are managing the conflict with activists uh, effectively. Wow, Dirk, thanks for that assessment. It makes a lot of sense with me uh, to me. But with this, Dirk, again, we're at the end of uh, our time today on today's episode, uh, which took us to this amazing small town of Lutzerat in this unfolding story when it comes to brown coal mining, the economy, and the flashpoint in conflict between concerns over the climate and the economy. So Dirk, as always, let me consult my notes here and let me present our takeaways in a summary at the end here. So three things we could take away from the debate that ensued over this small German town. Firstly, as a manager, we must have a stomach for conflict. While we are not looking for it, we must not hide from it either. Conflict will at times be hard because the issues are hard. Secondly, effective conflict management requires preparation. There will be issues that you feel strongly about and that your counterparts will feel equally strong about in their perspective. You have to know why you believe what you believe. You have to know your facts and have your details together. Know your business, know your numbers, know the metrics that matter. Thirdly and finally, effective conflict management may require you to be assertive. Yes, you want to be constructive and always constructive, but don't be afraid to be forceful when the situation demands it. You don't want to be a bully, but you don't want to be a pushover e over either. Dirk, what do you think about that? Well, Christian, I think that's exactly it. Wonderful, Dirk. You know I love to hear that. <laughs> anyway, everyone, I hope you enjoyed our time together on the Jamar Leadership Podcast. As you can see, we are traveling across the world, bringing examples and stories and narratives unfolding right now. Uh, bringing them to conversation to hopefully present principles that you will find helpful as you navigate the business world, whether as a manager or someone looking to become a manager. So if you enjoyed, please, again, leave us a rating on your podcast catcher. That really helps the podcast grow here. And let us know what you think. We love to get feedback and we love to implement some ideas. But that's all our time for today. So I hope you will join us again in a couple of weeks when we'll have another conversation for you to enjoy. Until then, take care.